Reactor online. Sensors online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Hello there, mercs and mech warriors. It's been a while, but it's finally time for another Battletech battle report. I don't know about you, but I've had an awful lot of free time on my hands lately, and it's given me time to think. Thinking mostly about how a definitely dangerous but statistically minor threat, one that may or may not have been developed by a hostile foreign power, can get major governments worked into such a panic that they begin massive, unlawful expansions of their own central authority, and how quickly a population can buy into that panic and be indoctrinated into tone party lines, how quickly civil liberties get thrown out the window as soon as things get scary, how dissenting opinions get shouted down and dismissed as unruly peasants who don't know their place, and how overzealous police actions turn the citizens' protectors into their tormentors, how big tech corporations steer the narrative to suit their needs by manipulating data and censoring discussion, how incompetent, short-sighted leaders find new and exciting ways to make a bad situation worse, and how opportunistic would-be tyrants will take advantage of a crisis to entrench themselves and positions of supreme power, all culminating in a spiral of chaos that results in economic collapse, civil unrest, political upheaval, and eventually war and mass destruction and death on a scale known only to the gods. I'm referring, of course, to the periphery rebellions that led to the fall of the Star League in the completely fictional Battletech universe. <laughs> Don't know why I've been thinking about that so much lately. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. I mean, the periphery ended up just fine. Just look at them. They're having fun. Anyway, let's blow up some big robots. This game was played a few months ago, back before the world went completely insane, and took place at the Deep in Huntsville, Alabama. It's been a staple of the Rocket City's geek and pop culture scene for 25 years and has comics, collectibles, and games to spare. If you're in the Huntsville area and haven't been, I highly recommend checking it out once we're allowed to leave our homes. This is my first time playing this particular opponent, as well as my first time running this particular scenario. We also tried out a few house rules recommended by Death From Above Wargaming. I've seen a bit of discussion about their proposed rules among the faithful old grognards. Some people seem to really like them, others seem to really hate them, but I was curious to see if they speed up the game as much as they claim. I'll give my full opinion on the DFA rules at the end of the bat rep, but I'll say up front that my feelings were generally positive. Our battle takes place on the planet of Stein's Folly, a border world in the Federated Suns in the closing months of 3025. In July, the planet was invaded by the Capellan Confederation to be used as a staging ground for deeper raids into Davian space. This occupation didn't last long, however, as House Davian launched a counterattack that September, which drove the bulk of the Lao forces off-planet. A handful of Capellans have remained, though, and have begun a brutal guerrilla campaign. While House Davian prepares for a counter-invasion, they've hired mercenaries to mop up the remaining Laos on Stein's Folly. In particular, they've hired a detachment from the legendary former Star League unit, the Eridani Light Horse. The scenario is a recon mission. The defenders set up three objective markers during setup, and the attack Attackers secretly write down which of the three objectives is their target of interest. The attackers then have to the end of turn 16 to scan the target by getting within three hexes of it and escape off of their home edge with the recon data. The defenders must do everything they can to stall the offensive. These are the house rules we're using for this game, picked because they are meant to make the gameplay faster and bloodier without sacrificing the depth and immersion of the classic game. Adding extreme range means we can start shooting at each other much sooner. Adding forced withdrawal means we can neutralize enemies without needing to whittle down every last bit of armor and structure they have. And reducing the range modifiers means we're more likely to hit our targets. The DFA rule for group firing and cluster rolls are a bit of a contentious point since they do skew the dice a bit compared to the old-fashioned way of rolling 2d6 for each weapon. But the claim is that the trade-off of only having to roll two or three times for each unit instead of a dozen or more is worth it for the sheer sake of faster gameplay and less chart humping. And our final bit of preamble, let's meet the teams. Our attackers for this game are Lang's Lancers, a skirmisher unit loyal to the Capellan Confederation. Their commander, Captain Jun Lang, is piloting a Cataphract, a brand new mech for House Lao, carrying a particle projector cannon, an auto cannon 10, two forward facing medium lasers, and two rear facing mediums. The heavy hitting ace pilot is Lady Ping Fu in one of the scariest mechs of the Succession Wars era, the Awesome 8Q, which boasts a devastating three PPCs, and also a small laser, which I forgot the list, but it never comes up. Rounding out the ranks are the Fang siblings, Lu Fang and a House Lao favorite, the Vindicator, sporting another PPC, an LRM-5 long-range missile launcher, and a small and medium laser. His sister Chan Fang rounds out the list in an experimental prototype mech, a Raven-1X. 
Uh, yes, I know canonically the Raven doesn't debut until several years later, but one, the One X doesn't contain any of the later Raven's new tech, so it's not an unfair advantage. Two, the Harebrain Schemes battle tech has a fully equipped Raven as early as 3018, and that game had Jordan Wiseman, one of the creators of Battletech, on board, so if it's cool with him, it's cool with me. And three, the, the Raven's just a cool mech. Sometimes we should be able to just have something because it's cool. Meanwhile, our defenders are from the 151st Light Horse Regiment, still fighting fresh while the rest of the Eridani are canonically recuperating on New Avalon after a vicious campaign against Wolf's Dragoons. Their commander, Captain Wallace Stormy Cahill, pilots a Thunderbolt 5SE, the variant special made for the Eridani Light Horse, which strips the 5S's machine guns for jump jets, giving the brawler some unexpected agility. Their ace pilot, Asha Whirlwind Nazari, pilots a Cyclops 10Z, boasting a monstrous AC-20 autocannon, a mix of long and short-range missiles, and a pair of medium lasers. Marco Phoenix Montoya is up next in a classic Griffin 1N, a single PPC and LRM giving it solid punch at long and medium range, but making it effectively useless up close. And lastly, Cynthia Lightfoot Jackson rounds out the lance in a Locust 1M, a variant of the venerable scout mech that replaces its machine guns with a pair of LRM-5s, which gives it significantly more firepower, but leaves it with paper-thin armor to make up for the weight. The table is set, we've met the teams, let's get to it! Round 1, both sides begin deploying. The Aridani Light Horse begin taking defensive positions, not knowing which of the three objectives the Capellans have picked as their target. Lang's Lancers begin to move onto the field, keeping three of their mechs in a tight formation to form an extremely nasty firing line, while the Raven scouts ahead, using the terrain for cover. Neither side is in range to begin shooting just yet, but with the extreme range rule in effect, that's going to change very soon. On round two, the Lancers keep their formation while the Raven continues to advance from cover to cover. Most of the Aridani start hugging the hillsides to minimize the risk of enemy fire, but I make a huge tactical error and leave my Locust out in the open, hoping to pop off a shot at the Cataphract and rely on the next speed to avoid return fire. This does not happen. <laughs> When the shooting phase begins, the Awesome turns its particle cannons on the poor Locust and absolutely annihilates it, blasting off its right leg, left arm, and left torso in a single volley. Put into forced withdrawal but immobilized from the missing leg, Lightfoot has no option but to punch out. That's the downside of trading out armor for firepower. The Locust left herself wide open and went down faster than a Canopy and Cat Girl on a... <clears throat> Sorry. Round three, the Capellan firing line begins to assert its dominance over the field. Between those three mechs, they're throwing out five PPCs, an AC-10, and a mix of missiles and lasers that allow them to dish out up to 80 points of damage to anyone who gets in their crosshairs. The Eridani take up positions to try and oppose it, but since they were spread between the objective points at the start of the game, they just can't concentrate fire in the same way. Not much damage is done on either side this round, however, as the Eridani take some chunks of armor off the Vindicator's right arm, and the griffin takes a solid hit to the right leg, but nothing catastrophic. Round four is more of the same. Lang's lancers hold the hill so the raven can advance, while the light horse struggle to get into a better position. This time, the capellans do some major damage, as concentrated fire from the awesome and the cataphract takes off the cyclops' left arm and blasts chunks of armor off Cross Whirlwind's torso. And once again, the ELH aren't able to return fire in any meaningful way. The Cyclops and Thunderbolt's loadouts are both geared towards mid-range brawling, not long-range sniping, and Phoenix's Griffin just can't hit the broadside of a barn today. On round five, Whirlwind backs her Cyclops up behind the hill, while Captain Lang breaks off from the Capellan firing line to chase after her. Chan Fang also breaks away to close in on an objective, and Captain K. Hill and Phoenix move to intercept. The Cyclops manages to scratch the paint on the Cataphract's right arm, and Captain Lang responds by shredding the remaining armor off the Cyclops' left torso. Nazari can't afford to take more damage to that location, since that's where all of her ammunition is stored. Meanwhile, the Thunderbolt and Griffin put some serious hurt on the Raven, stripping the armor off of the center torso and getting a solid hit on the right leg. Still, Captain Cahill decides that trading blows with the Capellan's long-range firepower isn't working, and at the start of round six, he calls an audible. 
The Aridani withdraw behind the hills for total concealment. Now, if Lang's Lancers want to keep pursuing the attack, they'll have to move into closer range where the Light Force can bring the bulk of their weapons to bear. The Raven closes in on the objective, which has now been identified as their target of interest, but ultimately both sides use this turn to regroup, lick their wounds, and bleed off some excess heat. On round seven, the Lancers begin to break up their firing line, with the Cataphract now well out of formation as he moves in to suppress the Cyclops. Chan Fang and the Raven finally moves close enough to scan the objective, but unfortunately for her, doing so puts her right in the crosshairs of Captain Cahill and Montoya. Montoya lets loose with a volley of LRMs. Enemy mech destroyed. In an extremely lucky break, the Griffin that couldn't hit anything all day finally connects, both clusters of missiles hitting the head, killing the Raven pilot instantly. This is catastrophic for the Capellans, as now they have to break their formation even more since the Vindicator is the only mech left that's fast enough to reach the objective and retrieve the data in time. It's even worse for them lore-wise, since that Raven was an invaluable experimental prototype, and now it can be salvaged by the enemy. On round 8, Lu Fang, having just seen his sister reduced to a fine red mist, now has to pick up where she left off and advances his Vindicator towards the objective. Cahill and Montoya move to block, and Captain Lang turns from the Cyclops to cover his man. This allows Whirlwind to move her Cyclops out of cover, and even better for her, at a range where she can start putting the Assault Max heavy weapons to work. The Cyclops' massive AC-20 crunches into the Cataphract's right leg, taking off all its armor in a single shot, while her missiles and lasers slag armor away across the mech's torso. The sustained damage forces Captain Lang to make a piloting check, and in a stroke of disastrously bad luck, he fails, taking a wound as the cataphract goes crashing down. The Griffin takes some fire to the right arm and right torso, but not much else is done by either side. By round 9, the Aridani are smelling blood in the water, and they all start to converge on the downed cataphract. As Captain Lang gets back up, the Vindicator flanks the Raven, and the combat phase promises to be a bloody one. And sure enough, the concentrated fire from the Aridani Light Force eviscerates the cataphract, taking off its right torso, which also takes its right arm, knocking out nearly all of the heavy mech's weapons. Meanwhile, the Vindicator, despite having a perfectly lined back shot on the Griffin, misses with everything. I haven't seen a mech warrior blow an easy shot that badly since the Battle of Mallory's War. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. No more edgy jokes. I'm sorry. Anyway, the Cyclops takes some minor damage, but at this point, Lang's Lancers are firmly on the back foot. If losing the Raven was a turning point, neutralizing the Cataphract was the point of no return. Slugging it out with the Eridani and relying on superior firepower is no longer an option. Lu Fang must get that recon data and bug out if the Capellans want to have any chance of winning the day. In round 10, Captain Lang gets back to his feet while the Vindicator makes a break for it. The Griffin tries to intercept, but runs right into the Awesome's line of fire. The Griffin takes two nasty PPC hits, slagging armor off of the right torso and going internal on the left arm, knocking out its shoulder and lower arm actuators. Meanwhile, the Cataphract takes more damage from the Cyclops, including a through-armor critical that strikes the gyroscopic stabilizer, causing the mech to fall again. Things are looking bleak for Lang's Lancers at the beginning of round 11, as their captain tries and fails to get his crippled mech upright, taking another wound as he falls again. Even worse, some of the fall damage strikes the Cataphract's head, giving Captain Lang a fourth wound and knocking him unconscious. The Cyclops looms over the helpless Captain Lang, eager for the kill, while Lu Fang reaches the objective. Fang's Vindicator takes some minor damage from the Thunderbolt, and the Cataphract takes major damage to the center torso from the Cyclops. The shooting phase ends, and as we go into round 12... Asha Whirlwind Nazari puts the foot of her Cyclops straight through the Cataphract center torso, destroying the mech with the unconscious captain unable to eject. An unexpected display of ruthless aggression from the usually gallant Eridani, but when tempers run hot, chivalry often goes right out the window. Still, I imagine Captain Cahill is going to have words with Whirlwind after this fight. And, uh... I don't know about you, but I haven't seen the Aridani Light Horse stomp someone that badly since... <coughs> oh, go to hell! At the top of round 12, Lady Fu and her awesome quite literally turns her back on the battle and begins to withdraw. 
While this does expose her back to the enemy, it provides a tempting target to draw fire off of the Vindicator. And sure enough, Whirlwind, already seeing red and wanting payback for losing her arm, closes in on the awesome. Meanwhile, Cahill and Montoya move to cut off the Vindicator's escape path, and Liu Fang has no choice but to try and cut straight through them. The concentrated fire from the Thunderbolt and Griffin take off the Vindicator's right arm, eliminating its primary weapon, and also destroy three heat sinks with internal damage on the right torso. The mech is still standing, though, and Liu Fang is still determined to pull out a victory here. Round 13 sees Fang caught between a rock, a hard place, and three heavily armed mercenaries, as his escape route puts him in the crosshairs of the Cyclops, with both the Griffin and Thunderbolt able to line up back shots. With their prey now securely in the kill box, the Eridani Light Horse open fire. <laughs> and miss with everything. Volley after volley goes sailing past the beleaguered Vindicator, and the mercenaries are baffled as to why they just can't seem to hit the thing. Perhaps the spirits of his captain and sister are protecting Liu Fang one last time, or maybe Captain Cahill needs to chew out his technicians for shoddy work on their targeting systems. Either way, what should have been a turkey shoot has now become a desperate chase, as the Capellans suddenly have a real fighting chance of winning. In round 14, the Vindicator makes a mad dash for the board edge, with the Thunderbolt and Griffin hot on his heels. Meanwhile, the Cyclops continues to chase after the Awesome, hoping to neutralize the Capellan heavy hitter. The Thunderbolt and Griffin plink away tiny bits of the Vindicator's armor, but just can't land the hit to take it down. The Cyclops, on the other hand, absolutely devastates the Awesome, with its AC-20 crushing through the armor of the Awesome's right torso, destroying one of its PPCs. Long and short-range missiles gouge out chunks of armor across the torso and even score an errant headshot, though not enough of a hit to destroy it. And lastly, Whirlwind's remaining medium laser scores a through-armor critical on the Awesome's left torso, destroying its second PPC. In just a single volley, Lady Fu's Awesome went from pristine to practically crippled. It's now round 15, and Liu Fang and the Vindicator has made it exactly to the edge of the map. If he can survive this round to move off the map in round 16, he can win the game for Lang's Lancers. The Capellan Warrior has been through hell. His captain killed. His sister killed. And word from the Lancers dropship confirms that more Eridani are closing in on them. But despite this, he can still make this day matter by delivering this crucial data to the nobles of House Lao. All he has to do is just... Enemy mech destroyed. Whirlwind turns her focus away from the awesome and puts an AC-20 shell straight through the Vindicator's spine, snapping the smaller mech in half. With her lance mates all dead, her own mech crippled, and her dropship dusting off without her, Lady Fu chooses to power down her awesome and surrender. The detachment from the Aridani Light Horse achieves a hard-fought but decisive victory, earning a healthy payday from House Davion in the process, and either a big fat ransom or potentially a new recruit with the captured Lady Fu. It wasn't an ideal victory as they lost their scout almost immediately due to a tactical blunder and might face some reprimands from the MRBC due to Whirlwind's brutal execution of a helpless enemy, but overall, Captain Cahill and his crew can hold their heads high after their first win on this tour of duty. Lang's Lancers, on the other hand, suffered an utterly catastrophic defeat, losing not just the mission, but losing three solid mech warriors, including their captain. And worst of all, the loss of the Raven means there's a risk that the prototype mech could be recovered by the Eridani, who may turn it over to their clients, the hated House Davian. All in all, it's a bad day to be a Capellan. But then again, when isn't it? My thoughts on the DFA Wargaming house rules are that, generally, I really like them. I've seen forum goons complain about how group firing doesn't accurately replicate the experience of rolling 2d6 15 or 20 times for each mech, and it's true that it does result in feast or famine scenarios where you might hit way more often than you normally would, or completely whiff an easy shot, but in practice? I found these complaints to be blown way out of proportion and seem to be based in a bizarro universe where dice only roll ones and sixes. I am a little iffy about combining extreme range with the reduced range modifiers going forward since it puts a huge premium on long range weapons and puts mechs with short range firepower at a major disadvantage. Granted, you can still win with up-close brawlers if you're clever about positioning and cover, but in an open field? LRM boats and PPC snipers are going to put you into a world of hurt. 
And that's saying nothing about Gauss rifles, extended range lasers, and oh god, clan weapons are going to be disgusting with these settings. And then again, that's the whole point of clan tech. Nitpicks aside, though, the biggest advantage about the DFA house rules is how much more you're able to get done. I got to play two games of Battletech this year before the lockdown, one using the standard rules, the other being the one you just watched. The game using the standard rules started around 5 p.m., and we had to stop at 10 when the store we were playing at closed. In those five hours, we got about eight rounds of combat, with no kills on either side, ending in an anticlimactic draw. Meanwhile, with the DFA rules, we got a full 15 rounds of combat, with several dramatic turns of the tide and plenty of kills and carnage to go around, all in just under three hours. Now, obviously, there are a lot of factors in play, different players, different scenarios, different levels of distraction, but that's still a significant gap. Enough time to finish a full DFA game and watch a movie while waiting for the standard game to end. In my opinion, the potential for faster, more action-packed combat is well worth the occasional statistical outlier when the piloting die goes screwy. Oh, and also, now that I've tried out cluster rolling, I never want to go back to the old cluster hits table ever again. Anyway, that's it for this battle report. I'd like to thank my opponent Douglas for a fun game. I look forward to playing against him again once things resemble some kind of normal. If folks are interested, I may make some videos playing single-player games of Mega Mech to scratch that Battletech itch before we get back to the gaming table proper. I'm also looking forward to playing some other games, as well as sharing thoughts and rants about stuff that isn't gaming-related, since this isn't strictly a gaming channel. But until that time, remember, Mech Warriors, no guts, no galaxy.